Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming back for our final series uh, for this Osher Mini Medical School. Um, this is our series on yoga for self-transformation, and this will be our last session of six, and we're in for a real treat today uh, for our uh, final session, which is going to be given by Dr. Patrick Mahaffey, and the title of this um, talk today is Yoga for Transforming Consciousness, the Chakra System and Jungian Psychology. So I'd like to give a little introduction right now to Dr. Patrick Mahaffey. Um, so Dr. Mahaffey is a religious studies scholar and a professor and associate chair and research coordinator for the Mythological Studies Program at Pacifica Graduate Institute near Santa Barbara, California. And this is an interdisciplinary humanities program that studies mythology and literature, religious traditions, and depth psychology. He teaches courses on Hinduism, Buddhism, and depth psychology and the sacred. And Dr. Mahaffey is a long-term practitioner of contemplative yoga. He's also the author of Integrative Spirituality, Religious Pluralism, Individuation, and Awakening. And he's the editor of Evolving God Images, Essays on Religion, Individuation, and Postmodern Spirituality. He's given many talks to Jungian societies, the Philosophical Research Society, and at the Parliament of World's Religion conferences held in Melbourne and Toronto. So it's my privilege and great pleasure to welcome you today. Patrick, thank you so much for giving us this talk. Okay. Well, hello and namaste to you and everyone. Thank you so much for those kind words of introduction. And I wanna thank Dr. Jane as well for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful series, which I've had a chance to participate in and watching a couple of the sessions and hope I can add something that will be enrich what you've already been able to feast on in this lovely series. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to give, uh, share some ideas that are near and dear to my heart uh, from the perspective of what I refer to as an engaged scholar, meaning somebody who practices these traditions that, that I've had the uh, opportunity to, to teach for, for nearly three decades. Um, and aside from practicing contemplative yoga you know, for close to 40 years, I've also experienced Jungian analysis, about five years of that. You know, so I have that as a practical experience, as well as the theoretical information that would go with the perspective that I'll be talking about tonight. And what I want to do is share ideas about the chakra system from both Jungian and yogic perspectives. And what I want to suggest is these views are different, but they are complementary, which is to say that I think they can be integrated in ways that expand and transform consciousness. So here, here's a quick overview of uh, what I intend to cover. I want to talk about Jungian psychology, secondly, contemplative yoga, very briefly, a little as time permits about my own version of integrative spirituality, and then conclude with a chakra meditation and go straight into questions you know, after that. Uh, now, to evoke uh, a contemplative ambience or atmosphere for our time together, I want to invite you to listen to a three-minute chant called the Mula Mantra, sung by Deva Pramal. And Mula is a word that means root. And the root for us, I'm suggesting to you, is what Jung referred to, and I'll be talking about Jung later, as the spirit of the depths, D-E-P-H-S, depths. Now, the Sanskrit words invoke the masculine and feminine energies of the divine that inhere in the core of our being. Don't worry about the meaning of the Sanskrit words. I'm just inviting you to allow your consciousness to shift by feeling the words and what the melody you know, would evoke for you. And there'll be maybe 15, 20 seconds of silence after we hear this piece. I'll ring a bell, and then, you know, and then we'll proceed. So here goes the chant. Satchidananda Parabrahma Purushotama 
So in this talk, I want to distinguish two modes of human development that are cultivated through different forms of what we can call inner work. One is psychological, the other is contemplative or spiritual. And I propose to you that these two modes of inner work are different in their focus and their methods, but they are complementary and ideally they ought to be integrated. But first, I want to characterize each mode of inner work on its own terms before seeing you know, how they might be integrated. So individuation is the psychological journey that Jung refers to as individuation. And it's a journey towards greater wholeness. I like to think of this as soul work. And it involves engaging the contents of your psyche, circumambulating your history, and integrating as much of who you are and have been into a greater whole. It's a maturation process. And for that reason, we could call it growing up so long as we understand that it entails a descent into what Jung called the spirit of the depths. Awakening is a contemplative journey. I think of it as spiritual work. Uh, and in contrast to growing up, we could call it waking up. And to paraphrase a Zen phrase, it's discovering your original face before your parents were born. That's actually a koan. I mean, what could your face have been before your parents were born? That's the point. It's nothing you can actually remember uh, because it's contentless. And I'll be saying a bit more about that. Now, the primary method for awakening is some form of meditation. And while content in the psyche arises, be it sensations, emotions, or thoughts, the practice is to merely observe and witness them like clouds passing in the sky. In other words, you do not engage with the content. Instead, you allow the mind to settle and descend into what is below the thought waves, to the backdrop and source of the fluctuating waves of emotion and thought. And that backdrop and source is consciousness itself. And to abide in that source in meditation is to experience the state of samadhi, or, to, or more precisely, one of the states or degrees of samadhi that occur when the ordinary machinations of the mind become still and silent. So this kind of practice, meditation, is not analyzing what arises in the psyche. Instead, it's about dissolving what ordinarily arises so that a deeper dimension of what 
of what, who one is can disclose itself, what the Hindus call the Atman, the Purusha, or the self with a capital S, or what the Buddhists call emptiness or Buddha nature, or what the Sufis refer to as supreme identity. Identity. In, other, in, in any case, it is your, what I'm calling your original face or true nature, whatever word we use for it. Now, both of these modes, individuation and awakening, are, in my view, very noble and profound human undertakings. But most people will only take up or engage in one of these modes or journeys of self-exploration. And I'm among those who think that to pursue one of those modes and not the other can be incomplete or one-sided. For instance, to pursue the spiritual journey of awakening without attending to psychological issues is what is aptly called spiritual bypassing, and it can have rather unfortunate consequences. For instance, experiencing deep mystical or ecstatic states generally does not take care of issues pertaining to anger, greed, power, lust, depression, or relationships. It may diminish it, but it won't take care of it entirely, and that is because meditation is not primarily designed to do that. But conversely, a person could engage in years or decades of psychotherapeutic work and never discover or touch what I've been calling their original face, to continue with the metaphor. And to give an, an example of the implications of this, a Zen master may have experienced a profound Kensho or Satori, even a number of them, but still be patriarchal, sexist, homophobic, nationalistic, xenophobic, and so on. And the same, of course, could be true of a Christian, a Muslim, or a person from any religious tradition. So moving now to part one, where we turn to Jung's perspective on yoga. And here's a photo of him in his study, a very celebrated photo of him. And in his memoir, uh, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, uh, we see the cover of the book here, he describes a period in his life that he characterized as a confrontation with his unconscious, which took about six years. Uh, and he expressed that experience in writing and images that uh, became available to us decades later in the Red Book. This is a small reader's edition version. The big version is like a huge coffee table book with exquisite prints. We'll see a few of those a little bit later. Now, this confrontation with the unconscious uh, during that period, he would document his dreams, his experiences, and his fantasy, fantasies and embellish them with creative artwork. And drawing mandalas uh, were a very important process of him emerging from a period of inner darkness. As his psychic ch state changed, so did the mandalas. And as he explains in his memoir, quote, I was being compelled to go through this process of the unconscious. And when I began drawing mandalas, I saw that everything, all the paths that I had been following, all the steps I had taken, were leading back to a single point, namely a midpoint. And it became increasingly plain to me that the mandala is the center. It is the path to the center. It is the path to individuation. Now that insight gave Jung stability, which gradually uh, restored his inner peace and had great importance for his life in psychology. And he writes again, I knew that in finding the mandala as an expression of the self, I had attained for me what was the ultimate. Perhaps someone else knows more, but not I. Thus, the mandala symbolizes this realization, which for Jung is the ultimate goal of the individuation process, namely the realization of the self. The process began with this in a state of fragmentation, but it culminates in a state of integration and unification. So here I display without any comment, five of the many beautiful mandalas that Jung painted in the Red Book to evoke the beauty and grandeur of self-realization through this process of him confronting the contents of his unconscious. So I'll just pause with, with each of those images for a few seconds each. Notice what they may evoke in your, in your psyche or mind as you view these. This last image is called the, the window to eternity. Now, 
Jung's inner work, in my view, has affinities to contemplative yoga, especially tantric tradition. And one of those would be the bandhas I've just described as symbols for the self. Another uh, parallel would be the priority he gives to introspection or the interiorization uh, of consciousness through meditation, that's typical of meditation. And Jung was familiar with the yogic concept of tapas or the psychic force or energy that's generated by spiritual practice. And in his view, the yogi, by concentrating his or her psyche, withdraws libido from both external objects, but also interior thoughts. Now, for him, that's a process that is akin to what he calls in his psychology active imagination. However, there is a significant difference between meditation in the yogic traditions and his active imagination. And the difference is this. In yoga traditions, a practitioner focuses on an image or an object. It could be uh, even the breath or a sound or a mandala or an image. And the purpose is to achieve one-pointed attention or concentration that culminates in absorption into that object to the exclusion of other uh, content. But Jung's psychology, by contrast, does not prescribe a particular object, image, set of exercises, mantra, and so on. His memoir reveals that Jung practiced yoga during that six-year period of his confrontation with the unconscious, but only for a very limited purpose. And he tells us what that is. And I quote here, I would do these exercises only until I had calmed myself enough to resume my work with the unconscious. As soon as I had the feeling that I was myself again, I abandoned this restraint upon the emotions and allowed the images and inner voices to speak afresh. The Indian, on the other hand, does yoga exercises in order to obliterate the multitude of psychic contents and images. Now, according to archetypal psychologist James Hillman, Jung's approach involves a dialogue with the contents of the unconscious. More specifically, in active imagination, attention is given to the images, emotions, or body sensations that arise in the mind. And it is concerned with the ego's relationship with and personal reactions to these phenomena. The emotional involvement with these images and their spontaneous reactions, the images actually reacting to the ego's attitude, are as important in active imagination as the images themselves. So I want to turn now to Jung's views on yoga expressed in his 1932 seminar on Kundalini Yoga. And here I provide a brief sketch of some of his commentary on the chakras that serves as a segue to a discussion of contemplative yoga and spiritual awakening. And in this work, Jung regards yoga to be a natural process of introversion. And he regards the chakras to be a rich symbolic storehouse of depictions of the individuation process that is what his psychology is about. And perhaps most important for our talk here is that he points out how the Indian yogic tradition differs from the Western approaches to the psyche. And uh, the, he says uh, in part here that the chakras become a valuable guide for us in this obscure field because the East and India especially has always tried to understand the psyche as a whole. And then he continues here with what you see on the screen. All this seems very strange to us because it appears as though India was fascinated by the background of consciousness because we ourselves in the West are entirely identified with our foreground, that is to say with the contents of conscious awareness. So Jung's primary interest is with the symbolic content that arises out of the unconscious rather than with consciousness or awareness itself which is actually the concern of, of yoga practitioners. Now, most of Jung's comments on the chakras pertain to the first four in the system of seven, if we include the crown chakra as one of the seven. And what I wanna do now is offer a very brief commentary on uh, or gloss on what he says about them by showing you first very briefly an image of each of the chakras and then Jung's uh, selective, some selective comments about what Jung had to say about them. So we'll start with the muladhara or the root chakra, which we see an image of here, artistic representation. And 
what Jung says is basically what's happening here is the gods, so to speak, are asleep, but the ego is conscious. Uh, or to say it differently, the, the self is asleep. Nevertheless, he gave it great importance to it because he says it's important to be grounded in this chakra. Otherwise, you're never really born. And if you're not really born, you can't possibly you know, realize the self. Now, with the second chakra, Swadhisthana, uh, which we see an image of here, he regarded that to be the mandala of baptism by which one, in the sense that one descends into the sea, meaning the unconscious, and encounters whatever is there. And the result of that descent, and it can be a perilous one, is either rebirth, which would be a positive outcome, or destabilization or destruction. You know, it might be putting it rather dramatically, but in other words, you know, not the kind of outcome one would hope for in terms of transformation. With the third chakra, Manipura, at the navel region, what he says about this is that it is the fire center and one's ability to tolerate strong emotional material is essential. It's essential we can do that for our psychological development because it provides the fuel, the libido or the psychic energy that is required for transformation. I want to add a bit more commentary to that because Joseph Campbell in the inner reaches of outer space made, uh, I think, a very interesting observation about uh, the chakras, uh, and it goes like this. The first three, meaning the, the root, the, the genital area and the navel, dominate the first 35 years of a person's life. If unconstrained, these energies become devastating. To transcend the order of this order of life, living at that level only, requires an awakening of the heart, by which he means a turning about of the energy in the sense of an application of all the available malice and aggression of chakra three, not outward for the correction of the world, but rather inward upon oneself. Now, here we see an image of the Anahata or the heart region chakra. And what Jung says here is that something new happens now at this point, because it's the possibility of, a ri of rising above the emotional events and dramas that have uh, previously dominated one's life and that can become so devastating you know, when one reaches midlife. Uh, when, this, when it, one experiences the psychological significance of this chakra, one becomes truly human. And he adds that in the experience of this chakra, individuation uh, truly begins. Now, interestingly, uh, Jung had very little to say about the, the, the remaining higher chakras, uh, but I will tell you uh, what he did say. And here's an image of the throat chakra or Vishuddha. He said here, there was a little to say about it because he felt that basically Westerners in particular hadn't really developed to the level that these three upper chakras actually represent. But to the degree that you can experience it, he says, you begin to consider the game of the world as your own game, the people outside of you as exponents of your own psychological condition. And it's basically, it basically is a situation where the world itself becomes a reflection of the psyche. It's a profoundly psychological experience beyond the experience of most Westerners. With the third eye or Ajna chakra, uh, there's even less you can really say, but he does uh, say uh, the following, that if one could rise to this level, you encounter a non-ego reality where the ego nearly disappears. It's almost unimaginable for Westerners. And here the gods that, or the self that was asleep at the root chakra are now awake. And as for the crown chakra, I just have one image here, uh, Sahasrara, uh, symbolically uh, depicted as a thousand petal lotus. For Jung, it was beyond human experience and thus an entirely speculative concept, he said, without any practical value for us. However, I feel this uh, observation needs to be qualified in two ways. First, the phrase for us simply means Westerners by and large have lacked a contemplative tradition that would give one access to that kind of experience. And then secondly, in his appendix to, the, the, to this book on the seminar in Kundalini Yoga, he offers an extended comment that points 
towards what is possible for us to experience. And uh, here, uh, it's a very important, I think, passage. So I'm, I've broken it into four slides that you can um, view as, uh, we, uh, as I read it to you here. So he writes, the typical course of a, of a analysis, psychoanalysis experience, expands one's awareness through working through repressions and projections, but the relationship of the ego and its objects, the content of the psyche, persists. The ego is intertwined in conflict with those objects. Continuing. However, if you take the analysis to a deeper level, then there is an analogy with yoga. If consciousness can be severed from its contents, which would be a detachment that he links to the process of individuation. It is as if he says consciousness separates or ego awareness separates from the objects and emigrates to the non-ego or to the other center, which is one of the phrases he uses for, for the self. Continuing further, this detachment of consciousness is the freeing from the tamas and the rajas, two of the gunas in Indian philosophy, which means a freeing from the passions and from the entanglement with the realm of objects. And lastly, he concludes by saying, this is not something I can prove philosophically. It is an entirely psychological experience felt as deliverance. And then he adds, what has, been, what has caused one to be previously seized by panic isn't panic anymore. One is capable of seeing the tension of opposites without agitation. And when that happens, one doesn't become apathetic, but is freed from entanglement or conflict you know, with, with contents of consciousness. Now, to summarize so far, so Jung is correlating the emotional entanglements with the early phases of analytical work the process of working through shadow material associated with the first three chakras. And he's saying that genuine individuation can occur when one develops the capacity to detach from sense objects, emotional complexes, and identification with the ego. And through such a detachment comes a profound experience from the travails of ordinary life. And it becomes a mode of being that is grounded in the non-ego or the self that observes or witnesses the tensions and the opposites of worldly existence. So here Jung provides the language that describes not only wholeness, which is the concern of his psychology, but, the, uh, but also the liberation or freedom that is the aim of yoga. Now, while Jung sees affinities between psychology and Kundalini yoga with regard to the first four chakras, I disagree with his assessment concerning the higher three, the throat, third eye and crown chakras by focusing on the chakras is only as symbols for his own depth psychology. He fails to acknowledge their significance for practitioners of contemplative yoga traditions, not only, you know, Indians and Eastern uh, people, but Western people as well that take up the practices in a careful, well-guided manner. So while Jung focuses on uh, the developmental process of individuation, he does not anywhere in his work actually encourage people to practice yoga as a contemplative discipline. In fact, to the contrary, he discourages Westerners from doing so. So in my view, his admonitions unnecessarily deter mature individuals from undertaking time-tested practices for awakening to the inmost self, the unconditional awareness or consciousness itself, which the Hindu tradition describes as the Atman or the witness. So now I move to part two, on yoga you know, as the journey to awakening. And historically, uh, yoga has had many meanings and it has changed. And I like to say that the yoga tradition has great recombinant power, meaning that it reiterates itself in new forms with particular inflections. And you've had some fine presentations already on yoga. So I'm gonna be fairly swift in the interest of time in, in uh, conveying some of the most important meanings of the tradition and moving kind of sequentially in terms of historical meanings. So in the Upanishads, it means union with the divine, a ground of being. Around the beginning of the Common Era, in the Yoga Sutras, it means the stilling or the cessation of the mental and emotional afflictions, or, or, or fluctuations, rather, of the mind. 
uh, also in the Bhagavad Gita, there are two important meanings, equanimity or even if, evenness of mind, but also skill in action. And then in the Tantra tradition that I will be concluding my presentation with, it means merging with the self, but also merging with the world. And I'll be saying more about those meanings a little bit uh, later. Uh, but here I want to suggest that what Heinrich Zimmer, um, a great Indologist and the, the teacher or guru, so to speak, of Joseph Campbell, observed in one of his excellent books on the yoga traditions, is the great achievement of the Indian sages was the discovery of the self, an entity that underlies the conscious personality and physical body, and that our naive unawareness of the self's hidden truth is precisely the cause of all of our misplaced emphases, attitudes, and self-inflicted existential suffering. Now, ignorance or avidya is the fundamental problem from the yoga perspective, not knowing the nature of reality and not knowing the self. And in Indian thought, that's referred to as maya, maya being a kind of net of entanglement that distorts our understanding. And Zimmer thought, and I quite agree, that to get beyond maya or that kind of illusion is to know uh, how it works and to transcend the spell that it places upon the human personality. And he describes this, I think, rather beautifully as learning the secret of the entanglement so that one can cut through into a reality beneath the emotional and intellectual convolutions that enwrap our conscious being, meaning our ego, egoic awareness and ego attitude. Uh, now, to learn that secret confers liberation, what the tradition calls, calls moksha and self-realization. Yoga is the means to that freedom. And what that means is that one is freed from a small contracted sense of identity and comes to realize or recognize oneself, what I've been calling in this talk, one's original face. Now, briefly with regard to the different yogic traditions that I'm moving through in a rather swift kind of way, uh, with the Upanishads, the Atman is the word for the self and it's characterized as being self-luminous, birthless and deathless, ever-present awareness, a state of consciousness that's termed the witness beyond waking, dreaming and dreamless sleep, it's said to be hidden in the heart. Yoga in the Upanishads is about discovering that through a discriminating type of awareness, which is typically called jnana yoga, or the way of knowledge. And the and aphorism that expresses it is that that thou art. You know, your inmost essence, uh, the Atman, is of the same nature of, of Brahman. Uh, now, the, there are two great experiential Vedantins in the 20th century, and this is an image of one of them, Ramana Maharshi who, uh, and you'll notice, by the way, at the bottom of the book cover here, that there's a forward that C. G. Wong wrote to this. And his core teaching was, was, was self-inquiry in the form of asking, like a Zen koan, who am I? And keep peeling the onion back until, you know, you, there's no real answer to that other than the experience of what remains. Now, the other great experiential Vedantin was uh, Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj. Here's a photo of him. Uh, his most celebrated book, uh, aptly called The Modern Spiritual Classic, is I Am That. And his core teaching, similar to that of Ramana, was to go deep into the felt experience of I Am. But the Yana Yoga tradition classically or traditionally has been uh, one that has been mostly a path of renunciation from the activities of worldly life. So when we move to the yoga of, uh, in the yoga sutras, this is true as well, because um, the main task here is to uh, still the mind from its emotional and mental fluctuations. Uh, Purusha is the term that's used in the yoga sutras. It's equivalent to the term Atman. But when we move to the Bhagavad Gita, we get a, a new iteration, a more expansive iteration of yoga, because here, this text teaches four different yogas namely the way of knowledge that the Upanishads and Yoga Sutras were, were teaching that I've just described, but also chapter six describes a method of meditation on Krishna. And to that, uh, we we're, were taught the path of action or karma yoga, and also the path of devotion or love called bhakti yoga. And in my view, uh, three qualities that stand out for this iteration of, of yoga in the Bhagavad Gita is it's for householders. Uh, not just monastics, and that yoga is not only the experience of deep interiority, 
which we typically refer to as self-realization, but it is also skill in action, beautifully exemplified, of course, by um, Mahatma Gandhi. So this text is integrating knowledge, action, and love, and in, thus, in my mind, a form of integrative spirituality. Now, when we move to the Tantra tradition, which, which is the last phase, the last iteration of recombinant yoga, we have a form of yoga here that uh, the word first, let's look at what it means. It means to expand knowledge or wisdom. It also refers to a continuum that connects spirit and matter. And the tradition, Tantra tradition that I want to talk about tonight is, can be called either Kashmir Shaivism because it originates from that region or it's great sages anyway, we're from that region or alternatively non-dual Shaiva Tantra or just Shaiva Tantra, which is the term I generally prefer. Now, why do I, uh, practice this particular form of yoga? Well, the reasons I would give you very quickly would be it's because spirit is believed to inhere in matter and in the body. That means matter, the nature, and the body are important. It honors the divine feminine. It provides an array of practices that integrate intellectual, emotional, and intellectual capacities. And its ultimate aim is to integrate the masculine and feminine principles personified by the word Shiva and Shakti. And this is also, by the way, the aim of Jung, Jung psychology. So we, we get another parallel here. What do I mean by masculine and feminine principles? Now here, Shiva actually means consciousness. And it, it is personified as the Lord of the Cosmic Dance. We'll see an image of that in a moment, but also as uh, the great yogi or Mahayogi. And Shakti, is, the feminine principle is creative energy, personified by various goddesses, including Parvati and Kali. But what's important for us to realize is these, these two are aspects of a singularity, what is sometimes called the Rudram uh, Yamala. Now here is an image of Shiva as the Lord of the Cosmic Dance, personified image. But remember, what we're really talking about here is consciousness. And here is an image of the dyad. Uh, he's standing next to his, his consort uh, Parvati in this beautiful bronze image here. So uh, I want to now briefly talk about some of the core texts of the uh, non-dual Shaiva Tantric tradition. And the first one is a text called the Shiva Sutras. And I'm just going to very now uh, momentarily just comment on really the first two. And the first one is the self or Atman is consciousness. And the second sutra is that ordinary knowledge is bondage. What does that mean? It means our ordinary kinds of our ordinary knowledge is limited, it's incomplete, and it's unaware or ignorance of its depth. So the remaining sutras in the text elaborate on how to awaken the fourth state of consciousness called the witness that's beyond waking, dreaming, and dreamless sleep, and how to infuse that into our ordinary states of consciousness, particularly the waking state. And by doing this again and again through contemplative practice, a practitioner goes beyond the witness to experience unity consciousness, meaning a way of being that entails seeing the uni unity that underlies all the diverse aspects of life. So this unity is why this philosophy in yoga is called non-dual, because it means there's nothing foreign or other to what you are. It means that each of us is an inseparable expression of the whole or expressed metaphorically that each of us is a unique wave of the ocean. And also, and very importantly, the inner world and the outer world are not separate or in conflict with one another because consciousness pervades both. And you are that consciousness that is your true nature. It is your original face. So the most concise articulation of this philosophy is in a text that's called the Pratyabhijna Rudayam, which translated in English would mean the recognition sutras. In, short, in a short 20 sutra text, it, it uh, very beautifully and eloquently uh, conveys the philosophy. Here, I'm just going to refer to a few points to give you the overall flavor of it. And it goes something like this, you know, Shakti or the feminine creative energy aspect uh, of, um, of the divine becomes the universe of, di of diverse forms including you and I. Shiva or universal consciousness in that process contracts into the individual soul or jiva. Self-recognition is initiated when Shakti or creative energy activates the Kundalini Shakti that's within the subtle body of a human being. 
And that awakening continues through what the text calls inner movement and unfolding the center through a variety of different yogas. Now here we see an image of uh, Kundalini, an artistic representation. And I just wanted to say some ver something very briefly about it here, because in this tradition, the non-dual Shaiva tradition, the attitude is to approach the Kundalini as a goddess, that is to say, as an intelligent energy in our body-mind that guides spiritual awakening. So the intention is to allow Kundalini to awaken herself and to unfold in a spontaneous way instead of trying to dominate and uh, arouse that energy uh, by strong, arduous types of means. And I think approaching Kundalini in this manner aligns with the attitude that Jung recommends, by the way, for encountering the unconscious. That is to say, a respectful dialogical stance in which one does not force or manipulate the dynamics of the psyche. Now, summing up, uh, I think, why I think this is such a profound uh, version of the yoga tradition, it's because it teaches it's not enough to go inside via introverted concentration, which culminates in merging with the self, which is quite an achievement and the achievement of much of the yoga tradition. But it says that's, that's, the, that's phase one. Phase two would actually be to join or merge with the world, to see your connectedness and your inner relationship to nature and other, other sentient beings. So to put it another way, first you see the divinity within, and then through continued practice, you come to behold it everywhere. And to do that becomes liberation while alive, while in the body. So with part three, I'm gonna be very, very brief about this uh, because my main point, which I've described uh, my approach to integrative spirituality in, in the book cover I'm quickly flashing here, is that I think the components of integrative spirituality need to entail the body, that is to say, be somatic, there needs to be an emotional, relational, psychological aspect. There needs to be a cognitive, intellectual aspect. But there also needs to be something uh, contemplative or what we might call spiritual as well. In my own case, it takes many forms. But in the interest of time, I'm just going to very quickly show you two slides that include uh, the array of practices that I do. Uh, at the physical level, walking, yin yoga. At the devotional level, something I call imaginal prayer, but also chanting use of mantras, uh, meditation, which uh, I, I uh, think is the railroad to awakening, but also textual study, uh, self-inquiry, which in my case includes journaling and dream work. But I also like to periodically engage in dialogues with my spouse in a practice we call counsel. I've done psychotherapy or psychoanalysis, particularly during liminal phases of my life. I also think, as Bob Dylan said in one of his songs, you gotta serve somebody. So some form of uh, service, professional work, or karma yoga, I think is essential. And in my own case, uh, periodic retreats. I go, try to go on retreats three times a year. And I've had the great good fortune of making seven trips to Indi India, which I, I thought of as, as pilgrimage. So with this, I come to the last part of our, my presentation on chakra meditation, and I I'm going to draw upon the work of one of my teachers, Swami Shankarananda, who writes, I think, the most accessible book, actually, on the yoga of Kashmir Shaivism, or non-dual Shaiva Tantra, called Consciousness is Everything. You see the title of it here. But this second book, Self-Inquiry, uh, Using Awareness to Unblock Your Life, is concerned with the chakras and contains uh, meditations that involve them, one of which we're going to do. So very briefly, I just want to convey the basic idea of that practice before we get a taste of it ourselves. So the basic idea is goes something like this. The reason why we don't usually recognize the deep self is because it's blocked. We can't, we, we don't gain awareness of it because of contractions of various kinds that actually correlate with lotion locations of the body and the subtle body, the chakras in the subtle body. And primarily, that would be contractions of emotion, of knowledge, and in action. Now, and uh, the traditional yoga refers to three knots, K-N-O-T-S. Uh, and you see this on the right side of the image, the, at the top, at the third eye, the Rudra Granti, in the heart area, the Vishnu Granti, and then at, at the lower part of the body, the Rama Gantri, uh, Granti. 
So these correspond to what are called the malas or limitations or contractions of awareness that you just see depicted on the, the left side here. Uh, this at the top, the Mayiya Mala is a contraction that is correlated with the, uh, the third eye chakra, the Anava Mala, which is correlated with the heart region, and the Karma Mala, which is located in the lower region of the body. And here's a, a, another image conveying the same thing with respect to a representation of the Grantis. So uh, what I want to just add to that now with the self-inquiry method, Shiva process self-inquiry method that Shankarananda developed, is that we, in our unconscious, we make we have internal language that that goes along with feelings we're having, but maybe not acknowledging. So the basic method, simple as it may seem, is to make an A statement, which, which means to make an accurate statement of present feeling. What might that be? Well, I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm powerless. Simply acknowledging that is the first step to becoming uncontracted, to uh, becoming unblocked in allowing awareness to expand. Now, to be more specific here then, the process works like this. By making an, a simple kind of inquiry, you become conscious of the contraction and able to unblock it. Uh, and you're able to do that by asking the contracted feeling what it wants to say by making these simple statements of accuracy with regard to what you're actually feeling in the present. So let's look at it uh, in terms of specific chakras. So at the navel level, an A statement might be, there's a lot I want more than I have right now, let's say, or I feel frustrated, or I want my own way, which means you're not getting it, you know, so those would be contracted feelings. You might not be aware of them, but to become aware of them is, is very useful. At the heart level, it may be that the accurate statement is you're feeling sad, you're feeling lonely, you're feeling hopeless. At the third eye level, the statements might be something like, I need to understand something, or I need to control this, or my situation feels chaotic, or I am confused. Now, uh, Shankarananda felt that in addition to the three grantis or malas, the throat chakra is also an area of, con uh, of contraction. Uh, and therefore he includes it in his process of uh, self-inquiry because a lot of uh, block communication you know, uh, can, can get stuck in, in that particular region. So the purpose of the practice then is to become conscious of the feelings in the unconscious, to let go of the feelings and contractions, and by doing that to come into contact or better relationship you know, with the self. So in a moment that we're going to do this, we're going to experience a, a 15 minute guided meditation. There'll be the sound of a tambora or a drone string instrument in the background with Shankarananda speaking very simple guidance. All you need to do is be relaxed, receptive, and to notice you know, what you feel when you follow the simple prompts you know, that, that go with this meditation. So you can adjust the volume of this on your end to your own liking. It begins very softly. And uh, so you may want to wait you know, 15 seconds or so if you need to adjust the volume. But then you know, just relax and, and see what happens. But before we do that, maybe what would be good, and just for a half a minute, I suggest that you, you stand up. You know, just, you know, you've been sitting you know, for about 50 minutes. So just stand up for a half minute, maybe swing your arms a little bit, and then uh, sit back down in a comfortable position. And when you're comfortable, I suggest you close your eyes and then just uh, listen to the meditation and participate in it. And then at the very end, there'll be some brief silence, just 10 seconds or so, I'll ring a bell, and then we'll go straight into questions uh, and discussions so that we have uh, ample time to do that. So I hope you will enjoy this. Here we go. Now we'll do the Shiva process healing meditation. 
In this meditation, we'll go back into each of the centers or chakras. We'll feel the feeling and we'll bring an affirmation in to see if we can open up the feeling in each center. Each of the chakras has to do with a different area of life. Let's begin by bringing our attention to the navel center. Feel the feeling in the navel center. The navel chakra has to do with personal will and desire. Often we feel constricted there when we feel a tension in our life, when we feel out of harmony with the divine will. So let's bring in the idea here of surrender. The words we'll use are, I let go. Bring the feeling, bring the words into the feeling. I let go. I let go. Feel the feeling in the navel. Bring in the idea, I let go. The image I use is of a boat on a lake. You're floating in the boat. You're not rowing. You're not steering. You're letting the current and the wind take you. I let go. I'm floating. I let go. It's a sense of not directing, not pushing, not pulling, not manipulating, just letting life flow. I let go. I'll move our attention up to the heart center. Become aware of the feeling in the heart center. The proper function of the heart center is to love. Very often our love is blocked by resentments. I like to work with the idea of forgiveness here. An alternative way of thinking of it is acceptance. And the first person that we have to accept or forgive is ourself. So feel the feeling in the heart center and bring in the thought, I forgive myself. Or alternatively, I accept myself. I forgive myself for being as I am. Perhaps I haven't lived up to some ideal. Perhaps not completely successful in every aspect of life. 
I forgive myself. I accept myself as I am. Bring in those thoughts into that feeling. This may be easy to do and you may find it very uplifting and that's good or you may find it difficult and if that's so at least it brings information. I accept myself. Now after accepting and forgiving ourselves, think of three or four or five people closest to you, your parents, your husband or wife, boyfriend or girlfriend, your children, close relatives, close friends, and one by one, envision each of them in front of you. Feel the feeling in the heart and say, I forgive you and feel the feeling that arises. Then after you've felt that feeling, then say, please forgive me and feel that feeling. Do this even if you think those issues don't exist with a certain person. The feeling may tell us differently. Alternatively, you can say, I accept you, please accept me. In each case, feel the feeling that goes with the statement fully. I forgive you, please forgive me. We'll take some time now to do that. Now we'll move our attention up to the throat chakra. Bring your feeling to the throat chakra. The throat chakra has to do with expression, communication. Bring the thought into the feeling. I express myself completely and freely. Sometimes we block our expression. 
We don't allow our thoughts and our feelings to flow naturally. We feel guilty, unaccepted, inhibited. I express myself. I express myself fully and completely. I express my thought. I express my feeling. Bring those thoughts right into the feeling in the throat. I say what I need to say. I say what I need to say to the people that I need to say it. I express myself. I speak my mind with love and compassion. I express myself. Now let's move our awareness up to the third eye, the brow center. Feel the feelings in the third eye. The third eye is the seat of higher wisdom, of spiritual awareness. Feel the feelings in the third eye and bring in the thought, I expand my awareness. I expand my awareness. Very often our awareness is limited by our limited understanding of who we are and what the universe is about. I expand my awareness. My awareness is wide as the sky, full of insight, full of compassion, full of wisdom. I expand my understanding. My mind is like a great spaciousness. It can contain all thought, all concepts, all ideas. I expand my awareness. All wisdom is accessible to me. I expand my awareness. Let yourself enter that expanded awareness and float in it. It is a sea of light, compassion, and peace. Now go back into the four centers and review them for a moment. Find the one 
that has the best feeling, the most expanded feeling. And for the rest of the meditation, go there and be in that feeling and be in that awareness. Okay, I hope that was uh, meaningful, um, and I'd be happy to take whatever questions any of you may have. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was incredibly illuminating and evocative exercise. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, was uh, that doesn't sound like it was your voice? Um, just well, wondering. No, that was no, that was actually Shankarananda's voice from the second book cover which has a CD of um, these meditations. And that's the second one that's slightly more expansive than the first one, which simply directs you to feel your attention at those four regions. But I thought it would be more uh, evocative and useful for people to, to do that version of it. And since he, since he developed it and has a lot of experience, I, I like listening to his voice myself. So I thought it might be better than my own. Thank you. And, and what is your uh, relationship with Shankarananda? Well, that's a long story. I, I met him uh, right after I finished my undergraduate studies almost 40 years ago. He, had, um, he was a devotee of Swami Muktananda and was asked to set up an ashram in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I, I'm originally from Michigan. So I went to that ashram and uh, experienced what were called intensives at that time. And I, I, that's when I first met him. But then fast forward, you know, some 25 years and reconnected with him. And uh, we developed quite a friendship. And I visited his ashram several times. I wrote the foreword actually to his book on self-awareness. And we remain in dialogue. And he actually was the coordinator for one of the Parliament of World Religions conferences in Melbourne, since that's where his ashram is near. And that's why I happened to be pre a presenter at, you know, at that particular conference. So it's just a long-term uh, spiritual friendship. Thank you, Patrick. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, I'm going to just read off the first one because it should be a little shorter one. Um, can we get copies of the two meditations um, or is there a link to, to that? Well, actually, you know, actually, let me go to screen share for just a second again. There's, I confine myself to just four references here, but the last two, are for, uh, books by Swami Shankarananda. It's the last book there you see below mm -hmm. that self-inquiry using your awareness to unblock your life that has this CD with what we heard and at least seven or eight other meditations that go with it. So that would be, um, it's, a, it's a very reasonably priced affordable book with CD. So that would be uh, the book to go to. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. A um, couple of other questions now. Um, let's see here. Uh, this is a, a kind of a detailed question, multi-parter. Okay. So get ready for this. <laughs> okay. um, so one of our participants is asking, I'm wondering if you could speak more about the three gunas and how they tie in to dual yoga, non-dual yoga, and integrative spirituality. Should I presume that our audience is familiar with the gunas, or do, do I need to say? Uh, no, more? that was that was not something we actually waded uh, too much into. We okay. just mentioned it in passing. Uh, it's more complex than this, but I'll I'll try to make it concise and clear as I can. So, in Indian philosophy and in yoga philosophy, there's the idea that there are three modalities of nature which pervade everything, including our body minds, and one of those gunas, tamas means inertia. Rajas means activity, and sattva means something like harmony, lucidity, balance. Uh, and we're constantly fluctuating through these. Uh, it's unavoidable. Uh, so for example, we wouldn't be able to sleep if you don't have an ascendancy of tamas, 
uh, because your mind would be too alert. You'd be too, there'd be too much for dissipativity. So that's a very short definition of how there are three modes of energy, but relative to the question that's being posed here is uh, how does that really relate to different modes of yoga, whether it's dual, dualistic yoga, non-dual yoga, or integrative spirituality? It's a very important and good question. Generally speaking, before I try to parse it in, in those three different ways, I would say this, the, the usual, um, the task of, of practicing yoga is actually to reduce the amount of tamas and rajas and increase the, the, the amount of sattva that you would experience, say, particularly in, in the course of your waking life in a given day. Now, it gets more complicated than that because ultimately, the Bhagavad Gita, for example, will say you want to go beyond the gunas. Well, what does that mean exactly when at one level we, you can't, as long as you're a psychophysical organism, those, those gunas are fluctuating. But it, I would suggest, for the sake of trying to be concise and clear, that it has to do with rising above the modulations and modifications and fluctuations of experience. So that term witness awareness points in the direction you know, of, of what um, it would be like to quote unquote, go beyond all three. But if we start to then say, well, what would, that, what would be the difference then between say, you know, dualistic yoga or non-dual yoga and, and a more integrative type of yoga? Well, I guess I would say this, the, the reason I prefer non-dual yoga is because I think that if we, any kind of a dualism, you know, Western context, whether it's Cartesian dualism, or even the Prakriti Purusha dualism in, in Indian philosophy, has the effect typically of devaluing one of those poles, namely nature or Prakriti. So uh, a non-dual tradition is, is actually trying to bridge that. And that's why I said one of the definitions of Tantra is continuum, because there's a continuum between, you know, what we call, say, spirit and matter. And uh, again, this is a bit technical and I want to make space for other questions as well, but in the Sankhya system of philosophy, which is coupled with the yoga sutras, with yoga philosophy, there are 24 tattvas. Uh, and uh, the tattvas are, are, are evolutes of prakriti. And purusha and prakriti, this is what makes it a dualistic system, uh, can never really be conjoined. They, they are independent, co-equal you know, entities, but somehow, you have to extricate Prakriti from Purusha. And the more sattvic you are, coming back to the earlier point, the more able you would be able to do that. But from a non-dual perspective, um, they add another 12 tattvas. You end up with 36. So there's a connection. There's a bridge you know, between what we call the phenomenal world or nature and matter in our body and consciousness or spirit or whatever term we want to, to use for it. So I think, you know, integrative approaches to spirituality are, are simply go very well with non-dual because we don't want to leave anything out. We have a body, we want to involve the somatic element. We are emotional, we have to bring our affect into, uh, into the picture. We're cognitive and intellectual, we need that as well. But even unlike Jung, in my view, I think the limitations of somebody as great as Jung and other great Western philosophers and psychologists is they didn't have much of a sense that there was some capacity beyond cognition as we ordinarily think of it. You know, And we can call that higher states of awareness, unitive states of awareness, intuitive states of awareness. It's what I mean by contemplative yoga. So I went very swiftly over my sketch about what my version you know of integrative spirituality would be but what i recognized for example is i started with meditation and it took me you know it was very enriching and i'm very grateful that i did it but i realized on one on a couple of longer retreats first in india and then later in australia with chankarananda's ashram that you can't bypass some of the relational emotional issues they must be engaged so of course, psychotherapy is one way to do that, but self-inquiry would be um, one way you can do this yourself. And, and chakra meditation is just one version of that. But I like it because it, it, it's operating with different planes of our being. 
and it's both integrative and in that, in that sense, I would say non-dual because it's giving equal value and place to the somatic, to the emotional, to the intellectual and, and the intuitive that goes beyond it. So I, I don't want to be too much, elaborate too much longer in terms of not being able to address other questions, but I hope uh, the person who posed that good question got something from, from that reply that might be helpful. Really beautiful and very comprehensive reply. Thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah, but there are a couple more questions we want to get to. Um, one of the audience member says in response to the chakra meditation that you closed with, that was surprisingly meaningful, an experience I had no idea I would have, such, such uh, as over being overcome with tears when focusing on the heart center and our closest relationships. Where can we learn more? Either of those two books by Shankar Nada, I think would be excellent. And uh, there are others, but I, I can find myself to, with respect to Kashmir Shaivism to, to those two books, because I think they're the most accessible. Uh, I, I, I'm not, I don't want to monopolize or, or I'm not in any way constrained or limited to that one particular teacher or that author, but uh, I can't recommend anything that would be more accessible than, than those, those two books. Um, I do, I would add, I'm happy to hear that that was surprising, that it, that it was moving. And uh, I think this practice is very simple and um, can be shorter, much shorter, in fact, than what we did. I wanted to give us a taste of something a little bit more expansive because uh, the, the most basic level to uh, of practicing it is just to ask yourself, you know, anywhere at any time during the day. Um, what am I feeling right now? Just ask that question and then just trust the word. I, I, I'm, I'm feeling sad. I, I'm feeling estranged. Uh, I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling afraid. Uh, imagine how many times we feel any of those things in the day and then the aggregate of it. You know, the micro experience of any one of those feelings is one thing the aggregation of them, the amalgamation of them becomes something much bigger and much more, you know, of, of a blocking kind of experience. But I want to add further to that, you know, I, I mentioned that journaling was one of the things I do most every morning. And, you know, one can write, or in my case, I've just been opening a Word document once a year, and I put the date. And, and the first thing I write is, what's going on? And then I quickly say, uh, I'm tired, I'm excited. I refer to something that happened yesterday. I, I was distraught by a meeting I was in, or I'm looking forward to a trip, or um, I'm afraid because I, that my brother is getting a medical test and the results might not be good. I'm worried about that. Just bringing to awareness, you know, what gets stored up is uh, a great way to honor your own heart to tune into your own heart and just ask your heart, since that was the focus of this question, what's going on there? What's, what's, what's concerning my heart right now? And then, you know, if you want to add something like, you know, I, I accept myself or I forgive myself or I, I, I value myself, um, I cherish myself, you know, give it some nurturance. So those are some thoughts. Thank you, Patrick. A uh, couple more questions here. Uh, what do you think of the physical expressions like the yoga asanas and exercises that we practice here in the West? Well, I, you know, I think they're great. And uh, in fact, if I have one regret in my life, I wish I would have undertaken a much more robust hatha yoga practice decades ago. Uh, what I can say in my own case is I have been practicing yin yoga. I take a class, at least one class per week, and then I do a small collection of asanas, you know, every uh, morning that take maybe 15, 20 minutes, mostly to help stave off back trouble and so forth. But I, I think asanas are great. But but uh, what I would say is this, and 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 here I appreciate Jung. Jung realized that yoga is much more than asanas. Uh, and he lamented the fact, and this was, you know, 40, 50 years before it became, Hatha Yoga has become so prevalent and available. Uh, and that's why I use the word contemplative yoga, because yoga, it, to use the Indian word, is a darshana. 
it's a it's a comprehensive vision or philosophy of life, a way of seeing, and it has so many dimensions to it. And uh, what people often find in last week's presentation was interesting. Many people who begin with Hatha Yoga end up finding that the most meaningful thing was uh, the development or cultivation of their spirituality, or that becomes the leading edge of it. It can go in the other direction. For me, I actually started off with meditation and then realized, you know, that, see, I was being, to go back to the previous question, kind of dualistic. I wasn't really giving my body the importance that it needed. So I brought that online. And similarly, with this uh, self-inquiry uh, approach with the, the, the chakras, I realized, you know, the emotional life has to be attended to as well. And not just when you're in therapy, but daily. It's, it's part of what you need to attend to and take care of, not only for your sake, but for the way you're going to be treating others. So there's, that's my thought on, on that. Thanks, Patrick. Um, one more question, and this is, again, a little bit of a deeper, more comprehensive answer, perhaps. Um, but how do you understand kundalini awakenings that leave the yoga practitioner in a state of constant shadow or psychological distress? As the questioner no doubt knows, there's a, a lot has been written about spiritual emergencies have been one phrase that's been used for this when either through deliberate cultivation in a very often strenuous kind of way, you know, whether it's through vigorous pranayama or other kinds of physical postures, you might uh, bring about an awakening that uh, was more than you bargained for, or more than you can actually handle. So I think uh, that's serious business and more than likely you're gonna need some help uh, from one or another kind of professional to stabilize it. Uh, I made a very brief comment uh, about my own view from the particular lineage or tradition that I practice in about respecting Kundalini as a intelligent energy that should you should let let it lead, let it you know unfold gracefully in its own way. And I think that people who practice in that kind of, there's no complete inoculation, I must add here, but I think that approach is much less likely to produce, you know, shadow material or psychological distress, as the questioner put it. But, uh, but again, you know, and here I'm slightly shy and reluctant to uh, say this, but I'll, I'll be a bit self-disclosing. On um, the second retreat, that I did in India, 21 day retreat was very profound experience. I felt more content with my life than I'd ever felt. I, I, I couldn't, I was astonished by how peaceful I felt. I came back and I don't wanna get into too many details here. I'm not a person prone to drama, but I created a bit of a mess in my life. Um, and I went, it was the second time I went back into Jungian analysis to clean it up and that's when I really realized that self-inquiry must be a part of the process. And Jung speaks, for example, of inflation is the term he uses for somebody who receives too much energy and can't, can't integrate it or quite handle it. So I had, uh, I didn't think I was the kind of person that would be prone to inflation. Wasn't, haven't been since, I'm happy to say, but it happened then. And I, I sought the help I, that I needed. And uh, it, it was a shadow experience. It, 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 the technical term that Jung uses is an enantiodromia, is when you flip into the opposite of something. Uh, so for, I went from extreme contentment and peace to somewhat chaotic uh, situation you know, in, in my personal life and needed to take care of it. And, uh, happy to say I was able to do it. And, but I think that the real cautionary tale is that it should be built in. You know, the, the idea that spiritual contemplative yoga and spiritual practices are all about getting blissed out is an incredible mistake. Actually, it goes the other way around. Spiritual practice is mostly about um, discharging, dissolving, depotentiating you know, what was involved in those lower three chakras, to go back to the quotation from Joseph Campbell, the, the aggression, the lust, the um, insensitivity, um, 
you know, that, ne that really needs to be uh, modulated, relativized, uh, put into proper perspective, you know, such that you're in good relationship with yourself and therefore can be in good relationship with others. So I hope that that helped a little. It, it's, a, it's a very important issue. It was a good question. Totally agree, Patrick. Very important issue. And you answered that really beautifully. Um, I would just add to that, that in the traditional lineage of yoga practice practices, one usually works with a teacher. Um, this isn't usually something you just undertake entirely on our own, which is, uh, I think, a much more common idea in the West that you can just sort of take this up on your own as solely, um, you know, without guidance from a teacher. And that's very uh, different from the way that it's traditionally practiced. And I think one of the safeguards of having a teacher and a guide in this process is that if there are these Kundalini awakenings or other kind of um, transformations of consciousness that evoke all of these disturbing images and disturbing right. contents of the psyche, there's a way to sort of contain and hold and work with that material when you have a spiritual guide. I absolutely agree. I'm so glad you you added that. And I, I personally feel I, I've always had some kind of connection to one or more teachers and one or more sanghas or kulas or communities of, of practice. And not that teachers and communities and groups are um, always totally ethical or healthy as well. So there has to be maturity involved and uh, not denying, you know, uh, you can't slip into denial when you see things happening that you, you know, in your gut, you know, are not ethical or not appropriate to, to, you know, how the, how yoga should be practiced. So thank you for adding that. Yeah, well, thank you for this, uh, again, really illuminating talk and uh, weaving in so many of the different themes that we've actually touched on from our earlier sessions. Um, so this really concludes our series um, on yoga for transforming consciousness. So um, we just want to thank you so much, Patrick, for your participation this evening and for all our panelists um, who participated and contributed um, to these really uh, enlivening and illuminating sessions on yoga. And my co-chair Priya uh, Jane is not with us this evening, but I just want to thank her as well for working with me on coordinating the series and arranging for all of our wonderful speakers and, um, and thinking through um, how we wanted to arrange the series uh, in terms of a nested unfoldments, um, series of nested unfoldments uh, leading to tonight's talk. So uh, thank you all for audience members for tuning in, for participating and for your questions, uh, which really added to this discussion this evening and earlier evenings. So thank you all and good night. Namaste. Namaste.